and appreciation this morning. He is so worthy. Thank you, Brother McCullough and their family and for the praise team for such excellent praise and worship music that they are bringing to us. And uh, so good to see Brother Mike. We know that uh, he had surgery and he's doing well. He's recovering. And uh, he also has a procedure, not tomorrow, but the following Monday. And so please keep him in, in his prayer and his family, Masu, as they, as they continue to take care of him and look after him. Uh, next week, uh, Sunday, is Mother's Day. And so we want to invite each and every one of you to come out and let's celebrate and these mothers and let them feel special. Anybody thankful for our mothers this morning? Amen. Thank God for, for each and every one of them. Without, without them, you know, we wouldn't even be born. Uh, and it's, you know, seeing my wife and the way she is cared for, for children and, and carrying those babies for nine months, uh, delivering them, and even her as a mother recovering from birth, uh, the birth of her babies. I mean, it's just powerful. And, and just seeing what my wife went through, even with our firstborn, you know, having an, an emergency C-section, I, I tell you what, I appreciate my mom and my dad uh, so much uh, after you have to raise kids, you know, on your own when your parents said, uh, one day you'll look back and you'll be thankful for all the things we've done. And, and I'm thankful for that. One more time, we give our moms and our dads a hand of appreciation. Amen. Maybe your mom's not around anymore. Maybe your dad's not around anymore. But the legacy and what they've instilled in you lives through you in your life. And I'm sure that you're making them proud by the way you live your life as you obey the Lord and the Father. And we look forward to be uh, reconnected to them one day when we are in the arms of Jesus. But uh, please come out and, and celebrate and make our mothers feel special this morning. Is Miss Cynthia here today? There you are. Well, yeah, just slip your hands up. Will you give her a hand of appreciation? Uh, uh, she, she called the church, the church phone yesterday, and we had a great conversation. Um, she said, you know, she's used, used to be so, so um, interested and, and caught up in material things until God stripped it all away. She lost everything. And now that she has understood the true meaning of life, is life in Jesus Christ. And she said God has been blessing her abundantly and she's able to pour into the life of others around her and she's such in a good place and she's here with her goddaughter. She said, you know, I'm coming and I have, uh, I have my goddaughter with me, five years old. She's on fire for Jesus. And I told her, I said, you come to church. We have kids' church. Miss Anna is doing a phenomenal job with the kids. We don't see her over here on this side very often, but she's there pouring into our young people and we just say thankful. We're thankful for that, Miss Cynthia. Thank you for being here with us this morning. God bless you. We also have Brother John with us. Will you give him a hand of appreciation this morning? Amen. Church, keep praying. God's sending people. Keep praying. And when they come in, love on them. Amen. Love on them. Make them feel at home. Everybody that walks through these doors should feel special. Uh, John is coming from Bithlow. And uh, he said he used to go to this church maybe 14 years ago. He doesn't remember who the pastor was at that time, but uh, he said he's been trying to get his schedule worked out so he can be here. And I'm thankful you're here, and we hope for, we look forward to seeing you. Any of you like to bowl? I found out this morning uh, that, that our precious mother over here, she, she liked bowling, Miss Evelyn, and she was on a bowling team, and she went to States and won. The, this, oh, we got another bowler. We got a lot of bowlers here. <laughs> But uh, we had a bowling a few weeks ago, and, and uh, we'll probably do that again sometime. But uh, he's, a, 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 I would say, a professional bowler. And so maybe next time we get together, you know, he can come out with us and bowl with us. Um, what am I missing here? My wife. Okay, she, she finally, she graduated. <laughs> I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she did it. She did her college degree online, got her master's now in counseling, mental health, and she's actually working. She was doing a paid internship, still is. But um, that company said she's doing such a good job. The college, I don't know, she, she's raising the kids at home, going to school, helping me out with the church. And they, the college asked her to even be on the dean's list. So I don't know how she did, done it. But, um, but, but praise the Lord for that. And, and thank you for all that you do as a mom in the church with the kids, the family. And now uh, doing her schoolwork, she's there trying to give her more and more clients. And she... Uh, what I love about her is she, she, she's, she's not able to tell me the things that, her, that she deals with with those clients. It's confidential. But she says, I go into each session and I pray and I ask God for wisdom yeah. to deal with those people. And we need yeah. godly counselors. Yeah. Amen. The Bible talks about godly wisdom, godly counsel. Yeah. Amen. Don't listen to people who don't 
understand the Bible or giving you counsel that doesn't line up with the Word of God. We need people in our life, mentors, who will put us and push us in the right direction. Amen? Amen. I want to say uh, welcome to, to Miss Charlotte and Brother Jesse back there. It's great to see you all, and uh, we've missed you. Special welcome to you, and praise the Lord. <laughs> all right, we also have Miss, Miss uh, Shepherd. I know she sits to the back, and she keeps to herself. She said, don't mention anything, but her birthday is Tuesday, amen, and she is going to be 84 years old. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> One of the uh, longest standing members of this church. She's been through a lot. She's seen it all, and she's here, and she's faithful, and she's pressing on towards the mark. I love when we went to her house, and, uh, Dr. Mann and I, and we just sang songs. She said, I want to sing some of Pastor Green's favorite hymns, and she knows his favorite song, uh, he, she, Amazing Grace. She knows his favorite scripture, and we just had church. We had church at our home, amen? So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for each and every one of you, all that you're doing, and all for what God is doing in this community. I want to continue our, our, our uh, I call it a series, but... Um, you know, I want to continue part two of turning trials into triumphs, amen? The things that you're going on in your life, I believe that God has a, a purpose for it. He's, he's using it for his glory, for his honor, amen? And uh, this will be part two. Um, Pastor J.D. Simmons would like to come visit with us, and hopefully nothing else comes up, but he is planning to be with us on the 30th. That's May 30th uh, this month. So please come, invite a friend. Uh, he said he wants to see each and every one of you. So let's fill this place with people and let him know how special he is and how much we appreciate him and, and Miss Vicky, amen. Uh, Brother Shumain, he's in Bible college right now, and so he comes on Wednesdays, and he has a calling on his life, a, a, to a prophetic calling, but also to work with kids. And so he's plugged up with, with Eric and Sharon and Pastor Jerry, and he's helping on Wednesdays. And, and uh, Eric called me this week, and he said, it's such a blessing to have him. So, so uh, as you saw him up here, uh, Mr. Shumain doing the offering, I, I'm, uh, we're going to help uh, as God has called him to put him. And that's what God has called us to do is to find, find people where they are and find out what they're calling us and give them an opportunity. If you make yourself available to God, he'll take it from there. Amen. So we're giving him opportunities as he's learning, as he's studying to, to minister to God's people and walk in his purpose. Amen. And uh, we have a powerful, powerful, powerful Mother's Day service for you next week, Sunday. You don't want to miss this. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Brandon, we're good to go back there. <laughs> Father God, I give you praise and I give you honor. I thank you, Lord, for who you are. You are so faithful. God, I thank you for our mothers as we get ready to celebrate, even our fathers next month, God. We've got Independence Day coming up, and we've got a cookout, and so many things that we're doing and trying to be a blessing to this community. I pray for Second Harvest as people come to get physical food, that they will get spiritual food as well. They will be fed. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for Miss Katie, Miss Shepherd, seeing another birthday. Lord, this community, this church, our children, all of our loved ones, God, Brother Mike, I pray for healing in his body. Brother Richard, oh God, touch your people, touch those that are sick and hurting in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless Chuck and Teresa, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray a double portion upon his life, God, as he continues to seek your face. Lord, I pray for all of our leaders, oh God, all the heads of our department, our council, Lord, as we get together and we pray and we seek God's face as far as learning, know, knowing what your, your vision is for this church and for this community. We give you praise and honor, Lord, as I speak, as I share your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that you can use me as your oracle, Lord. Whatever I have to say, that it will come from up above, that I will speak with authority and boldness and confidence knowing that this is a word from the Lord Jesus that we can take back and we can apply to our lives and we can tell someone about the goodness of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. Bless us today as we continue to go out and do what you have called us to do. Bless us on the job, on the workplace, to be safe on the road as we travel, Lord. Safe on the job. And I thank you, Lord, most importantly, that we'll remember, God, the importance of having a daily time with you, a solitary place where it's just you and us or you and our family and we're praying, we're seeking your face. As the church continues to pray, Lord, you will give the increase. And I thank you for doing it. I thank you for your Holy Spirit going out, Lord Jesus, and compelling the hearts and the souls and the minds of men and women from this community to come in, that they will be set, they fed, Lord, and they will be made disciples where they can go out and preach Jesus Christ and make disciples, Lord, and we will turn this place upside down for the kingdom and the honor 
honor and the glory of Jesus Christ. We give you the praise and the honor. And everybody, will you just put your hands together and give God a, a hand of praise this morning because he's so worthy. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is part two of, of turning your trials into triumph. And if you missed part one, it's, it's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, share it. There's people watching. Uh, somebody called me the other day from New York saying their sister passed away, but they watched the sermon online. And people are watching online, our online viewers, we greet you and we bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, somebody called me last week. They, they weren't in church. They said, Pastor, we, we watched online and we felt the Holy Ghost. We felt the Spirit of God watching it from home. And so we bless you and we thank God for the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. Amen. All right, media team is going to help me out this morning as we pull up our text. I don't know if this back TV um, is off, so I don't have my, my text out there, but we're starting with... Um, we, we talk about an understanding mind, and you could go to the scripture right there after, um, after, after the, the uh, Psalms. And what we're doing basically is we're going through the book of James. We believe that this James uh, is the, the brother of, of Jesus, and it's what he wrote for us, and he wrote it to the church, and he was dealing with the issue of spiritual uh, immaturity as a church. And so he was saying there are some things that we got to work out and we got to deal with as we, as we come together and we serve God. So maybe you're a Christian and, and, uh, and you want to read and get a, get a deeper, have a deeper walk with the Lord. I encourage you to read the book of James. Amen. And as you read it, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for understanding. And James tells them, he said, I, uh, you, we need to be doers of the word and not just hearers only because there are people who know what the word of God says. Even the enemy knows what the word of God says, but he's still the devil. Yep. So you can know the word of God. You can preach the word of God, but the word of God says that my sheep know my voice. They hear me and he says they obey me. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to hear the word. It's one thing to read the word, but to obey what the word says, that's something totally different. So we've got to not only hear and know what the word says, but when you read the Bible, say, God, you might read a verse or two. You might read a chapter. Say, Lord, how can I apply this word to my life? What can I do? What can I change? Who can I bless? Amen. So James chapter 1 and verse 2, James says, My brethren, count it all joy. I talked about turning your trials into triumph. The first thing we know is we must have an understanding mind, a, a believing heart, and a positive attitude when we begin to, to uh, do what God has called us to do. This week I was, I was in Volusia County. And I met this lady, and she just started talking to me, and, and, and it was two uh, elder ladies, and they said to me, they said, um, you have such a positive attitude. And they said, what do you do for a living? What do you do for work? And, and I, I hardly ever tell people I'm a pastor, you know. I just oh, I just do ministry. And they said, that's incredible. And um, I used to do jail ministry in Orange County. The chaplain that got me into the jail, he passed away with cancer during COVID, but um, I hadn't been able to get back in there, and I miss, I miss going in there and ministering in the jail. And this lady said, you have such a positive attitude, and, and she said, somehow I feel in my spirit like this is a, a, is a divine appointment. And, and she said, what do you do? I said, well, I, I do ministry. And, uh, and I told her I used to do uh, jail ministry, and, I, and she said, I'm a chaplain. And I said, really? I said, I used to do jail ministry in Orange County right there in Orlando at 33rd Street. And I said, I miss going in there. They've made it kind of difficult after COVID to reopen the doors. She said, my husband is the head chaplain for all the prisons in Volusia County. She says, here's my number. Give me a call. We'll get you back in there to do jail ministry. And I thank God for divine appointments. When you open your Bible, when you pray, ask God for a divine encounter. Say, Lord, let me walk and meet somebody today. I mean, in the middle of nowhere where it seems like, but nothing that God does happens by chance or happens by accident. You are not a mistake. You are not a surprise. The storm in your life, the trial in your life is not a surprise to God. It caught you off guard, but, but hold on to Jesus. Hold on to his everlasting arms. Amen? Amen? And ask him for divine encounters. As I minister to people during the week, I say, Lord, today, help me to meet somebody and tell them about who Jesus is. Help me to find some way to connect with somebody. And there are times where I feel the compelling the tugging of the Holy Spirit to say, tell this person about me, tell this person about me. If you will open your mouth and ask God, say, Lord, as I speak, because it's intimidating, right? To, to, we can talk about Jesus here and it's great, but to leave and go talk to an unsaved person about the Lord, it's hard sometimes. But say, Lord, as I open my mouth and I speak to this person, give me the words to say, and you'll see that he'll start 
there's times I pray for people and they say, how did you know what I was dealing with? How did you know I was going through all this? Again? I don't know what you're going through. But as I pray, I trust and I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me and direct me as I speak to this person that they will hear what they need to hear. Because the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm looking at you in your face, but I know that I'm talking to the spirit man inside right. of you. This outer garment is just the body that we're clothed with. I'm, when I speak, I'm not speaking to the faces. I'm speaking to the spirit. And so God says in the book of John 4, I am a spirit and I must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And so I pray for you. I pray for this community. I fast and I study God's word and I say, Lord, what does your people need to hear? What are they dealing with? Because I can't look at your faces and know it's a spiritual thing. Amen. So James is dealing with some of this stuff and he says, count it all joy. A good attitude in the middle of whatever it is you're going through. Count it a joy. I know that's hard. Well, Lord, I, I, I lost my job. Count it a joy. Count it a joy, right? When you fall into various trials, you're either going through a storm right now, you're going through a trial right now, or you're getting ready to go into one. Where God says this life is full of troubles, many troubles. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I need more patience. But look at what the Bible says, that the trials will bring you to patience. So is it possible that God wants to give you some patience, so he's putting you through this test so that your faith is tested? Because when we go through a trial, we're tempted to fix it. We're tempted to help God, and we want to find a shortcut. But with, there is no shortcut in life. The only shortcut you can get is if God blesses you and gives you a double portion and God can do that, but when we take matters into our own hands and we say, God, I know that you want me to wait, but I don't think I can wait. I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to jump the gun. I ran track and field, and when they got that, that guy, he says, on your mark, get set. And some people will jump that gun. They're so anxious. And he'll, he'll shoot the gun twice, pop, pop. That means let's reset. Now, anybody who goes again after that, before that gun, you're disqualified for jumping the gun. Wait. There are times in our life God wants to teach us patience and the importance of waiting on him. He said in the book of, he told the disciples, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Because the power of the Holy Spirit will give you boldness, will give you confidence, will give you authority, will give you power. I don't want to be a pastor or a preacher that has no power. I mean, I love when I hear stories that I go to the hospital and I lay my hands on the sick and they tell me, Pastor, we recovered from that disease. And I say, thank Jesus. Amen. We are here to be effective. I'm not here to tickle your ears. I pray and I ask God, Lord, what do your people need to hear? Amen? Amen? Look what he says. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete. Anybody want to lack nothing? He said lacking nothing. This is what the testing of your faith does. It causes you to get into a place in your life with God that you lack nothing. As a child of God, when you belong to him, he says, thus, when I do funerals, I always say that verse, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. All the things you've acquired here on this earth, they stay right here. Right. Amen? So we lack nothing. We come into this world naked, and we leave naked. The most the people can do at your funeral is maybe throw some flowers in there, but you're, that's it. You're done. My uncle says uh, they've expired, and he just makes a joke out of that. But, but look what James says. If any of you lack wisdom, now in your trial, you're going to need some wisdom. But the word of God says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust God. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. So in the middle of your trial, say, God, what are you teaching me in the middle of this? And I pray that you will give me, God, I lost my job. Give me the wisdom to get another one. And this time, maybe I can do some things differently. So he says, if you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God. If anybody lacks wisdom, ask God. And he says, who gives it to all liberally without reproach? And he said, it will be given to you. All right? He said, but let him ask in faith with no doubt. There's people that say, God, I know you can heal my body and I thank you, but I, I'm not sure if you really can do it. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you're really going to do it. You know, that, that's why the, the, he said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because there are times we believe that God could do something, but we doubt. Lord, I know you can change my circumstances. I know you can change my finances, but, 
But then the enemy comes in and he says, I, I don't know, are you sure God could do that? And now you start getting into defeat because you're thinking, I, I don't know if God can do that. This is what James is telling the church. When you ask God, ask with no doubt in your heart. And ask by faith. Say, Lord, I know it's done. It's done in Jesus' name, and I thank you. He said, Lad, ask of faith, no doubting, for he who, who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven to and fro, tossed by the wind. Amen? Amen. He says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything. If you ask God and you doubt, God says, I, don't, I have nothing for you. He, he said, you will receive nothing from the Lord when you ask and you have doubt in your heart. You ask with confidence and boldness in the name of the Lord. He said, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. All right? James is talking to the church. He's talking to the church. Look at what Solomon says, uh, or they're referring to Solomon. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. On that night, God appeared to Solomon, and he said to him, Solomon, you, you remember the movie Aladdin? I don't know if some of you, and the genie gave Aladdin three wishes, right? I, that's what, every time I read this text, I, I picture the genie coming and saying, I give you, I give you three, uh, three wishes or whatever. But God came to Solomon. Think about that. God comes to you, Brother Jimmy, Brother Chuck, Brother John. God comes to you. Ask me anything you want to, and I'll gonna, I'm going to do it. Can you imagine if God said, ask me anything you want, Chuck? Maybe, I'll, maybe I would have asked for a million dollars, a bigger house, a nice car. Who knows? Some of you might ask for a new spouse. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ask God what's the return policy, right? <laughs> God said to Solomon, Ask me whatever you want, and I'm going to give it to you. Wow. This is what Solomon says. He said to God, You have shown great mercy to my father David and have made me king in his place. And he said, Now, O God, let your promise to David, my father, be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth and the multitude. And he says, give me wisdom. He could have asked for anything in the world. He could have asked for gold. He could have asked for more land. He could have asked for more cattle. Give me wisdom. He said, give me wisdom and knowledge so I can go out before your people and I could judge them, this people of yours. That's what, that's what his wish was. And so here's God's response. God said to him, because this was in your heart and you have not asked me for riches, you have not asked me for wealth or honor or the life of your enemies. He could have asked for the life of his enemies. God, I want you to slaughter all my enemies. God would have done it because he said, whatever you ask, I would do it. He could have said, everybody who talks bad about me, can you just... Lights out. He could have done that. He, God said, you didn't ask me for that. He said, nor have you asked me for long life. Some people are so terrified of their health. I talked to people, they got a lot of money. And when nobody's around, I was sitting in the car driving. I'm millionaires, okay? Crying. I said, what are you crying? You got all the money in the world. I'm so anxious and worried and fearful of death and sickness. I heard one pastor say, I prefer you pray for me and for the church than for you to write me a $100,000 check. Because when there's a sick person in the hospital and you go and you lay hands on them and they get healed and delivered, you can't put a price tag on that. Right. When there are sons and daughters that are prodigal sons and daughters that have walked away from the faith, walked away from home and living a wicked and unrighteous lifestyle and the church prays and that sinner comes home and heaven rejoices, you can't put a price tag on that. So church, your finances are important, but I need your prayers. Amen. This community needs your prayers. Amen. We need each other on our knees. He says, you have not asked for knowledge. Uh, he says, but he said, nor have you asked for life, but you have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge, God says, are granted unto you. And he says, but I will also give you the riches and the wealth. Yes. Because the word of God talks about getting the wisdom or getting the power to get wealth. Mm -hmm. God wants you to have money and, and to be a blessing to others. Not to be selfish. He knows our heart. But to bless people. I hate when people come to me and they ask me for money and I don't have it. 
I said, God, if I had it, I would give it to him. God knows your heart. He knows the desire. He gives you actually the desires of the heart. He says, I will give you riches. I will give you wealth. I will give you honor, such as none of the kids, the kings who had ever been before, nor, nor shall there be any like you. People came all over to, 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 to see, see the, the, and, and experience the wisdom of Solomon. Verse 12 of James chapter 1. And I encourage you, it's just five chapters of the book of James. Read it through. Uh, you, five chapters, you could read one chapter a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Just read, just read James. I mean, when you read the, the word of God, the spirit of God goes out. The spirit of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. And it can break the bondage of things in your life that you need help with. God will give you that. He said, blessed is the man. This verse, I, I put this verse on here because when I was a college student, Okay, I, got, I moved off campus. I got my own apartment, my one-bedroom studio apartment. I would pray there. I would study there. I would do my homework. I would do my assignments. I would write my papers. But I had a mirror in that little apartment, Brother uh, Tom. And, and on that mirror, I put this verse so I could look at it. Every time I woke up, when I walked in, when I'm leaving, I looked at it. And it said, blessed is the man who endures temptation. If you can endure this trial. Because when he has been approved... He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And God says, let no one, James says, let no one say when he is tempted, as people as pastor, I don't know why God's tempting me. God's, God's putting, let no one say that I am tempted of God. Because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor can he himself tempt anyone. Does anybody know who the tempter is? Who is the tempter? Come on, let me hear it. That's right, the devil, Satan. He is the tempter, so no one can say that God is tempting me. The devil comes to tempt you. He said, but look at this. Each one of you, when you are tempted, are drawn away by your own desires and enticements. And he says, therefore, submit to God. Now, I want you to say this to your neighbor. Say, resist the devil. devil. One more time. Say, resist the devil. Come on, say it loud. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When I was growing up, my my grandmother lives in New Jersey. My sisters and I, we would go to New Jersey and we'd visit her. And she's a a praying woman. She's always praying. And before we had to go to bed every night, she would bring us in her bedroom and she would pray for us. And she would tell us, you know, the devil, he's not going to come with this big, ugly, scary looking costume or whatever, this ugly face. When the devil comes, he's going to come with something that's shiny, something that glitters when he wants to tempt you. And he knows your weak point. And I hope you know your weak point. Because if you struggle with drinking, that's where he'll come. He's not going to hit you with cigarettes or marijuana or cocaine. But if your weakness is drugs, he'll come. We've ministered to men on the streets that were homeless, drug addicts. They got delivered, came to church, turned their life around before when they would scrape up the last bit of their paycheck to buy drugs, to buy alcohol. Now that they've turned their life over to Jesus Christ, they've got friends calling them, come on, Brother John, hang out with me. Let's buy a drink. It's on me. Now they're getting it for free because that's how the tempter works. He is not your friend. He comes. He go, the Bible says your adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. He'll bring you out on a limb and he'll leave you there. He'll make you a laughing stock, an embarrassment, a shame to the church, your family. That's what he wants and he'll laugh at you. He'll bring you far and then he'll just leave you there all on your own to face it. Submit to God, resist the devil, and then what will happen when you resist him? He will flee from you. That's why we need the church. We need the church. We need to be in the house of the Lord. Because I know you get, tomorrow morning, temptation is going to be knocking your front door. And you can come to church and be ministered to by the brothers and sisters and hear the word of God and sing and worship and praise God in the middle of your trial. And look what he says in verse 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The prodigal son, when he realized that I'm living a mess and I'm going to go back home, 
he turned and he went towards his father and the father was there waiting for him and he ran out to meet him. So when you turn and you draw near to God, he will meet you where you are. But he's not going to drag you by the collar and force you. you got to say, Lord, my life belongs to you. And you start working your way towards him. He'll, he'll draw near to you. Now, the prodigal son, his brother, he was jealous. He was jealous because his brother went out, blew everything, he came back and his dad threw a party. <laughs> and he said, Dad, come on. I've been here all along. I've been faithful. I've been taking care of all the animals. I've been serving. My brother takes everything, goes out, squanders it, comes back home. You throw him a party? That father says, son, everything I have belongs to you. When you're a child of God, you might say, God, how come I see all these people being blessed and money and financially and getting raises and, and it seems like they're doing well? God says, son, daughter, everything that I have belongs to you because you are mine. Everything I have belongs to you. But there are some of you that have been serving God for many, many years. And when people come to the church, sometimes we get intimidated. And we may even say hurtful things to the newcomers. But when new people come to the church, we should greet them and love them, make them feel warm and at home and special. And now you have this in every church. Every, ch every church I've ministered at, youth pastor, praise and worship director, anything I've done, you see where people come in, new people will come. And they'll start singing. And somebody that's been sitting in the same seat for 20 years say, how come they get to sing? Well, you've had the opportunity all these years. It, this is your church. So don't get mad when God saves an alcoholic off the streets and he turns his life around and he's on fire for Jesus and he says, what can I do for the kingdom? Amen. Let's move on. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days, any true Christian needs to be fasting and praying. That's right. Any true serious Christian needs to be fasting and praying. If you read through the Bible, all those powerful men and women of God were fasting and praying. That's where you will receive the power and your eyes spiritually will be open. You can see things. But you've got to deny yourself in order to have the lights turned on spiritually. Jesus was fasting into the wilderness. And, and, uh, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was hungry. So the tempter came. Who's the tempter? The tempter came to him and he said, If you are the Son of God... Command the stones to be turned into bread. Now Jesus used his weapon, which was the word of God. And when the enemy comes to you, you use the word of God. Jesus said to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Almighty God. Jesus quoted scripture back to the devil. He resisted the devil. He said, you know what? You're right. I'm a little hungry. It's been 40 days out. I could just turn the stone into bread and I could fulfill that hunger. Jesus understood his purpose. He understood his destiny. And he understood that the enemy wants to steal what God has predestined you to do and accomplish. Then the devil took him up in the holy city and he said to him, uh, he sent him on a pinnacle of the temple and he said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now the enemy is quoting back scripture to him. That's why you got to know your Bible. Because the enemy knows the Bible, and the Bible talks about there are false teachers, and they will transform from ministers of darkness into ministers of light. So just because someone is giving you the word in the scripture doesn't mean that they're necessarily working for the kingdom. Because you can use the word of God and twist it and cause it to be a lie. The enemy took the word of God. He says, okay, Jesus, you want to talk Bible? You want to talk scripture? Let's talk scripture. He said, it is written. The angels can give, give a charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So I hope you know your Bible, because the enemy will use the word, even the word, 
to get you to fall. It all started with Adam and Eve. Did God really say, we talked about that in Tom's class, the men's fellowship. Did God really say not to eat this fruit? He created that doubt in their mind, which caused them to fall. And here we are with all the suffering. God had to send his son to restore the relationship. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up in an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And look what he said. He said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, the enemy was right in offering those things to him because the Bible tells us that he is the God of this world. Okay, God is sovereign, but God has given the enemy a certain amount of authority. That's why the enemy was able to say to God, remove the hedge you have on Job. Let me, let me ruffle his feathers a little bit. And sometimes God will allow the enemy to even tempt you. He said, I, I promise you if, you, will, if you will take away everything, he'll turn his back on you. The enemy has authority to even give you things to bless you, so to speak. But there are blessings and riches that can cause sorrow. And the Bible talks about that. When God blesses you, he adds no sorrow to it. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. It is, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The devil left him and the angels came and they ministered to him. Amen. Proverbs 4.23 said, above all these things, guard your heart. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So in the book of Acts chapter 2, and I'm believing God for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in this church. Amen. We've already seen a couple that, that were, that were uh, touched and received the power of the Holy Ghost, and I want more of that. I met with our leaders, and I sat down, and I said, what, do all, well, what would you all like to see here? Let's, let's pray. Let's pray together. And they said, you know what? We want to see people get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I said, I'm so glad you said that. I'm on the same page. Let's do it. But how did it happen? Uh, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all in one accord. They were all in one accord. Amen. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to him divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Hallelujah. I'm believing God for a, an outpouring of His Holy Ghost. Not only we want lives saved, families restored, but we want to see a move of God. I'm asking you, church, to pray that we will... There's people that tell me, Pastor, I want to see miracles. You can pray. And say, God, Lord, bless this church with miracle signs and wonders. Start asking God for divine encounters. Start asking Him to perform a miracle. And when, when the disciples were performing miracles, this attracted people from the outside to come. When the community finds out this church is on fire for the Lord and the things that are happening, because I'm telling you, church, the only reason they're at the bar drinking because... They're going through hardships. They're not partying. They're trying to numb the pain. Those drug addicts, they're not there having a ball. They're, they'll lie to you and say, oh, let's party. Why? If your life is so good, why do you have to be intoxicated? If your life is so great, why do you have to be high and out of your mind? If you have such a good life, come on. They're hurting. These people are hurting. And you know what else? They're searching for truth. They don't want fraud. They, want, they don't want fake. They want to know, do these people live what they say? Do they live according to what they preach, or are they hypocrites? And the, the minute they find out that you're hypocritical, they don't want it. I hope that each and every one of you, if you, if you tell somebody in your neighborhood you go to Redemption Church, I hope your life matches up to that because you're representing our church. You're representing the kingdom of God. So James tells them, he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. If you humble yourself, God will establish you. The word of God says, humble yourselves and he, and he will establish you. But 
There are times where God will use things in your life and he will humble you to lift you up. My wife and I, I told you this story. Some of you may have heard it, maybe not. When I was in college, we met because we worked together. She was my supervisor. But (laughs) I got all the days off I needed. (laughs) Ah, Brother Mike said nothing's changed. (laughs) She's still my supervisor. (laughs) But we were servers, and we were not just servers. We were servers at a retirement home. And the Lord taught me so much during that time of serving those people. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a humble thing to bust tables, you know. So when we go to restaurants, we tip good. We're polite to the service because we know what it's like being on the other side of that table. But if you're coming into the house of the Lord and you want God to establish you, you have to humble yourself. Because Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve. I came not to be served, but to serve. So if we're going to be leaders, we have to be servant leaders. We lead from in front. If you're not willing to sweep the floor, vacuum the carpet, I mean, Jesus said to them when he was getting ready to be crucified and he washed their feet, Peter said, you can't wash my feet. I mean, you're the king. God said, if I, Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. You have no part with me. A couple weeks ago, it was late at night, Saturday night, I wish I was at home praying and reading the word, and, but I got a message that we needed Clorox and air fresheners and paper towels, and it was after 10 at night, almost 11, and I'm in Walmart, and I'm thinking, God, here I am buying paper towels. We got church in the morning. <laughs> and God said, this is all part of it. You got to be, if you're not humble enough to do little things, you can't do big things. The way up with God is down. He said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. If you find your life, you'll lose it. Some of us, we feel too big, too prideful to do some of the little things. I love when we went to California, and I sat back and looked at those veterans. They said, we hadn't seen these veterans in months. We don't know how you guys got them. I mean, we prayed before we went. She called me. She said, fast and pray. Fast and pray. We were in Florida fasting for California and those veterans. When we showed up, the staff said, we don't know how you guys got them to show up. We were in Florida fasting and praying. So the Spirit of God quickened them. And they came out in numbers. But she gave them, Dr. Letitia, she gave them spiritual food, physical food. And they came. And when we made that altar call, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the hands went up, at that moment I was like, It was all worth it. It was all worth it. And I thank God for that. But sometimes you got to know how to serve in order to lead. You don't lead and not know how to serve. You got it backwards. So he says, uh, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. Uh, I've never done as many funerals as, 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 as the time of COVID. I was pastoring here, but I was out doing funerals. Funeral, I mean, funeral, young, old, 38, 40-year-old, funerals, a lot of funerals. Then I'd go on Facebook, and I'd see people posting, you know, I wish my mom was here, and I could tell her one last time I love you. I wish I could tell my dad I'm sorry. I wish I could say I forgive you. So life is short. Appreciate and love those today. My pastor in Tennessee used to say, Give them the flowers while they can smell it. Give them the flowers while they can smell it. Next week is Mother's Day. Maybe you've got some situation with some family member. You're not speaking to them. Give them the flowers while they can smell it. And it doesn't mean it, it's, it's a humble thing, but sometimes we let pride get in the way. You give them those flowers. Let them smell it. Because you know what? They may have hurt you, and you may not even be the wrong one. Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do. I think and I believe that it takes the bigger person to say, you know what, Jimmy? I know you've hurt me in my heart, but I'm still coming to you to make it right anyway. 
God says, by this, you will know that they are my disciples by the love that they have for one another. So when people come into this church and they don't feel loved and welcome, they'll say, I don't know about these people over there at that church called Christmas. When they come in and they see love, they see black and they see white, they see Democrat and, and Republican, they see everybody. They say, wow, these, these people must belong to Jesus because there's nothing but love in there. Amen? Amen? Amen. It should be bubbling over. We used to sing that uh, Jesus' love is a bubbling over. There's an overflow. Amen? You should walk in the Publix Tuesday and somebody will say, that, that's got to be a Christian person. They, they, they've got such a positive attitude. It's an overflow. That's why people can run into you in the middle of the market or whatever and say, what's this, what, you know, what's this, this, there's, there's a glow about you. Amen? Amen? James chapter 5, he says, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. How many of you believe that it's coming soon? Yes. And these are the last Amen. days. Amen. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. And he says, see how the farmer, I know it's Christmas, some of you all have farms and you got animals and yeah, all those wonderful things. He said, like a farmer waits, and, and I love hearing about your stories with your avocados and all those things. He said, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits, right, of the earth. You got to be patient. You know, I, I, I told Miss Gloria last week, I said, she said she's got av avocados, and she said, Pastor, I want to bring you some avocados. I said, you know, we had an avocado tree when I was growing up, and it had been about five years that we, had, we, we, we never saw avocados, and my dad got tired of that thing. He said, I'm going to do like Jesus. I'm going to cut this thing down. <laughs> he cut that tree down. Miss Gloria said to me last week, she said, it takes about five years before you get the first avocado. <laughs> Some of you are on the brink of your break point, yes. of your breakthrough. You are right there. Mm -hmm. you, you walked five years with the Lord, and you're like, ah, I don't really see a whole lot of change. I'm going to go back to my old ways. I want to let you know, stay firm, stay hold, and stay true to Jesus Christ because you are on the verge of your breakthrough. Don't give up on God. And he says, be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Amen. Now, he says, I wish there were some more people in the sanctuary today because I had them in mind when I put this scripture up here. <laughs> do, not, <laughs> do not grumble. He's talking to the church. Do not grumble against one another. I'm mad that I didn't see them. I hope they go back and watch online. <laughs> Maybe you're watching online. Do not grumble against one another. There's people that come and try to talk to me. Pastor, let, did you hear about this one? And, and they'll say, you're running from me. Yeah, I'm running. You know why? <laughs> life is short. Yes. And some of us, that's why we can't move on in life. You're worried about the past. You're worried about the people who's hurt you in your past. And you become a prisoner of your past. I don't want to talk about the people who left the church anymore. I'm tired right. of it. Right. If they left, I'm telling you as a pastor, one of my responsibilities is to protect the sheep. Yes. And I can't tell you guys everything. But I have to protect the sheep from wolves. Yes. Amen. And so if there was something that I saw that was hurting the sheep and I addressed it, and it took an offense to somebody and they left, I say, thank God for the time you've been at this church. God bless you. We love you. These doors are always open. Amen. But I'm not going to allow you to hurt God's people. That's right. Amen. I'm sorry. This church is going to be called a house of prayer. Amen. And we've got to protect one another. Brother Tom, somebody comes to you with garbage, and I, I love Brother Tom. He's got such a good heart. Don't entertain it. Mm -hmm. Don't entertain it. Say, I'm sorry, I, don't, I really don't want to talk about this. Because God is doing a new thing. I want to talk about the people that are coming, the people that God's blessing, and the people that uh, have their lives that are being changed and transformed. And if they've left the church, I mean, pray for them. Yes. Love on them. Call them. Let them know Jesus loves you. But I don't want anybody coming to me and grumbling about other church members. I don't want to hear about it. Church, life is too short. Right. I don't want to hear about it. I'd rather be praying at home, reading my Bible, studying God's Word. I don't want to talk about church members in a negative way. If you come to me and say, God, how can I bless Brother Chuck? We could talk about that. That's right. 
How can I bless Brother Green? We could talk about that. You come to me to co complain and grumble, I don't want to talk about it. David says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. He says, I will rather dwell in the house of the Lord than, to, than in tents of the wicked. I don't want to be around wicked people. I'd rather be in the house of God, not talking about his people, but loving them and praying them. Nobody's perfect. We all have issues that we're dealing with. I, I, I have a mentor of mine that, that I talk to every day, and, and, and I said, you know, there's people who have literally gifts of prophecy or whatever the gifting is, but I said, there are some things they do that kind of throw me off. And he said, preacher, none of us are perfect. He said, the gift in that person is perfect, but they're still an imperfect being. So you can, if you think that this church is not perfect, you're going to go find another perfect church. If you go there, you will ruin it. <laughs> Brother Eric tell me, he told me, he said, I, one, one time I left this church many years ago, and I went and visited another church, and he said, man, there was nothing different. I mean, it was good for a while. Every church has their issues. This is a place for healing. This is a place where sick people are come to Jesus Christ and know who he is. And he came back and he said, Pastor, I will never leave again. I learned my lesson. Because you can search all over. You'll never find nobody like Jesus. No, not like me, not like the person next to you, like Jesus. Don't grumble against one another, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door, and he will ask you to give an account of every word that you've said, every action you've spoken, every thought. You'll have to give an account for that. James 5 said, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. He said, We count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. I don't understand when Christian people are not compassionate to their brothers and sisters. We got to have compassion. Jesus was, I mean, that's the, the word of God says, that's why he fed the multitude. I always want to say, God, why did he feed the multitude? And he said, because of the compassion in his heart, those people were following him for days. They were hungry. And he multiplied the food. He blessed, just because he was compassionate. There's been times I have a $50 in my pocket and I'm meeting with somebody and God said, I know this is a stretch. I know, I know, I know, I know this one will hurt, but bless somebody. And I'll pull out that 50 and I'll give it to him, and I'll say, oh, God, I'm, I'm just being obedient. I'm trusting you. But when I tell you the windows of heaven are open, like Brother Shumain said, you test God, and you be faithful to what he says, because what you think you're holding on to, God's got something even better in store. But he'll test you. He said to Abraham, go and sacrifice your son Isaac. And Abraham went up there, and he told the man, he said, we'll be back, because he knew that God would provide a ram in the bush. But he was willing to give up what he had, and God blessed him. Are you willing? He told the, he, 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 the, the parable in the Bible where the, the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, all of these things, all of these laws I followed from my youth up. And he said, what am I lacking in my life? What am I missing? I mean, I, I follow all the rules. He said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He couldn't do it. <laughs> he could not. He, God, I, I, no stealing, no murder, no cheating, no lying, no adultery, no sin. I got that. Sell all I have and give it to the poor. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the we're going to, that's where we draw the line. And he went away sorrowful. He couldn't do it. He said, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. When your church member is hurting, you hurt with them. When they're celebrating and they're rejoicing, you celebrate with them. Is anyone among you sick? Call for the elders. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. He says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. You don't see your, your, your brother and sister in church? Maybe you don't have their phone number. You can say a prayer. That person that sits next to you that's not here today. Hey, Lord, I don't... I don't know what's going on. Maybe you can call them and check on them, but Lord, whatever's going on. Maybe they didn't have gas this morning. There's people literally told me, Pastor, I'd like to come every Sunday, but gas is adding up. I mean, that breaks my heart to hear people who say, I don't have gas to get to, to church. That, that's heartbreaking. Times are tough. 
A lot of people, most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. One or two paychecks missed and you're out the door, you're homeless. It happens every day. I remember I, went, uh, I uh, was waiting for a bus traveling from Tennessee and um, I stopped off in Atlanta, Georgia. And when I stopped there, my bus, uh, there was some kind of delay waiting for the bus. And it was freezing cold in Atlanta, Georgia, right there off of Peach, Peach Tree Street. Man, never felt so alone in my life. It was freezing cold outside, but they are used to all the, the panhandlers and everything. So you just, it's cold, but they got heat in the restaurants. You can't just go in there. I went into a hotel with my suitcase because we were waiting on the bus. The bus never showed up. And I went into a hotel where it was nice and warm and that there was a security there. And he said, sir, he maybe thought I was homeless. I had, I mean, it was cold. I had gloves and my thing on. <laughs> Pretty much was homeless, you know, broke college student. <laughs> he said, sir, you can't hang out here. And I said, Lord, what, what am I going to do? I mean, it's in the middle of the night. I, I saw this man, and I said, I'm trying to get, he said, Are, you know, you need help. I can, I can help you get, he said, there's a, there's, a, there's a homeless shelter. And I said, wow. He said, I, you can go to a homeless shelter. There's at least heat there. I didn't need food. I didn't want anything. I just wanted a place to be warm. And he said, I'll show you where it is. Now, we're in Atlanta, Georgia, okay? <laughs> I didn't plan on telling you this. We're in Atlanta, Georgia. This, this, this guy on the street, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll show you where the homeless shelter is. He walks me about halfway there. He stops. I said, is this it? I don't see anything. He said, I need some money for me to take you the rest of the way. <laughs> I said, my goodness. When you're desperate, you'll do anything. I pulled out the rest of the cash I had in my wallet. I said, bro, just please help me, please. He said, I'll show you where the shelter is. He'd have left me right there. I went to that homeless shelter, and the line was so long. The line was so long. There was a waiting line. People were standing outside because after a certain time, they locked the door because it's too full. And I said, God, what am I doing standing in a line for home with homeless people? So while I'm standing in the line, I start talking to the men around me, and I'm thinking, you know, these guys are on drugs. These guys are, they have no job. I was so wrong. These guys were former doctors, lawyers. And I'm thinking, how in the world do you end up here? A lot of them said we had it all. I mean, Atlanta, Georgia, they got a lot of money. They make a lot of money out there. And that turned my world upside down. And that's why I can go and preach. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I can go to homeless shelters and I can preach Jesus. As a college student in Miami, I went to Miami and we were doing music and the leader of the band said, Kenwin, will you preach to the people? I said, wow. Now, I grew up in church. I played music, keyboard, drums, instruments. My dad's pastor, third generation church of God. Never been asked to preach at a homeless shelter. And I went there, and I, I preached from John chapter 4, the, 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 the woman at the well. It was a simple message, but I did an altar call. I said, if you want the everlasting water that this woman experienced when she came into contact with Jesus, when her life changed, you want salvation, come forth. And people from that homeless shelter came up to the altar. That was my first time ever doing an altar call for the lost. And that did something inside of me. Because at the, at the end, the owners of the shelter came and said, we have preachers coming here every week. We have never seen this kind of response. I'm a college student. He said, pastors come in, they don't respond like that. And I said, God, this has to be you. This is above, beyond what I could do in my own flesh. But I said, from this day forward, I said, God, I don't care about money. I don't care how much money I make in the world. For the rest of my life, the feeling that I felt right there in that moment, laying hands on those people as they accepted Jesus Christ, I said, God, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. It's to lead people to your kingdom. 
I don't care. I'll do it for free. I'll do it for free. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. We did our revival last year. We had the general overseer, former general overseer, Big Mike and them, they did the, led the worship. We had a powerful time. Some, I was at a, a wedding yesterday, and somebody said to me, Pastor, I remember you guys did that revival there yesterday, uh, last year under the Iron Building. And he said, man, that was so big and powerful, and it was just an incredible. I want to do that again, you know. We got yes. to plan and, and, and really just church, this community needs revival. Yes. Amen. This church needs revitalization. We need Jesus. But I remember I got so many calls that week because we had about 85, 90 something percent chance of rain. Brother Chuck helped me paint this place, pressure wash. He was here day and night cleaning, getting this place ready. But I had people call me, Pastor, the mosquitoes are bad. Pastor, it's hot. Pastor, uh, you know, it's going to rain. I felt like Moses. Ms. Sharon said, you sound like you got the complaining Israelites there. <laughs> I said, it's really what it feels like. But you know what I did? I prayed and I fasted. During the revival, everybody was eating. I was fasting and praying. You know, with the 80 or 90% chance of rain, it did not rain. I said, Lord, hold the rain up so these complaining people can come and, and, and rejoice and have church. And when Dr. Tim Hill finished his sermon and we were doing the altar came, I mean, it's like all the rain that was being held up all week just busted down. And I was like, Jesus, wow. Now, I'm not saying I had anything to do with that. All I'm saying is I fasted and I prayed. I know it was 80, 90 percent chance of rain. And I asked God to hold up the rain. And we had no rain. That's what Elijah did. I was reminded of that. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone there, maybe somebody that left the church or whatever, and they, they turn back to God, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Will you stand to your feet, Brother Mikey, come? If you're here this morning and you're sick in your body, you need healing, you just want a closer walk with the Lord, I want to ask if you will come up here. We want to pray with you. We want to agree with you in prayer. If you know somebody that's sick, you want to stand in the gap with them, maybe you're saved and you say, Lord, I want to take my salvation a step further. I want to, I want to experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm just going to ask if you will spend a moment in prayer. Pray for the person next to you. Just uh, If you're hurting and you just want a touch from the Lord, you can make your way this morning. Come up to the altar, and we want to pray with you as Brother Mikey gets ready to lead us in worship. Just all, all around this place, just close your eyes and, and just put your mind on Jesus Christ. Maybe this word registered with you and you said, I want to turn my life over to Jesus. You can come to the altar. Let's make it right. Let's make it right this morning because life is short and you never know what's going to happen. You can come. You can come. If you've got sickness in your body, you've got a loved one who needs prayer, you can come. Make your way to the altar. We want to agree with you in prayer. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory, O Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's right, church. Open your mouth and let heaven hear you rejoicing. Let heaven hear you praying. Dr. Letitia, will you help me this morning as we lay hands on the sick? It says, call on the elders. In the name of Jesus, Dr. Je yes, that's right, that's right. Come on, church, open your mouth and give it to the Lord this morning. Tell him what's on your mind. The tears you're crying, he knows why.